man, I'm just keeping it real with you, Willie. She heard me say a lot of stuff on my platform that wasn't aligned with how I was moving at times and didn't say anything. So I don't want to get up here saying, well, yeah, this yeah, is a lie yeah, and no. that's a lie. No, no, that's real. I'll, I'll speak to that, though. It wasn't a, it was a, it was a lot of those women were in the times where we were single and we were both very single. We were both single. It wasn't just me. Yeah. it. We were both single. Love you more. Love you more. Love you more. Indeed. Family is your nephew, Willie Mo Jr. Love You More podcast. I'm excited about it. Um, a lot of people, I know you guys came up from the Willie Mo Jr. show, but let me just do this real quick. Can you put your right hand up in the air? Just even as you watch on the little screen, the big screen, wherever you watch, you put your right hand in the air like this. You so disobedient. Put your hand up. Okay, good. You got it. Do like this real quick. Go like that. All right, good. And throw that real quick. Go. Uh, you got it. Good. That's your church face. You're not going to need it at this point. Right. We're about to have a really good conversation. You know, when I started this podcast, um, I realized that for years and years, although extremely successful to some, um, I wasn't really necessarily loving myself. I got so caught up in being married and raising children that once um, I kind of got to this point in my life, people used to ask me, like, what do you do for fun? I was like, I go to work. Like, what do you, you know what I'm saying? Like, what the hell? Like, yeah, I go to work. But I realized that I wasn't loving myself. And of course, we know the Bible declares this, that we are to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And if you do not choose to love yourself and do something uniquely different with your life, it's unfortunate that you may not be in a position to get that life back. Like the one thing that I've learned now is that this is not a practice run. It happens to be life. And so because it's life, we got to live it to the fullest. So I decided to come up with a podcast to say, Hey man, let me challenge you to love you more, right? You, yes, you. Um, so many people tell me, man, I lost myself in my marriage. I lost myself with my kids. I lost myself with my job. And it's time for you to be found, right? And so with the guests that I've chosen and the people that are going to be on here, I believe that you're going to hear something, experience something that's going to change your life um, forever. So the gentleman who's going to be with me today, I'll be honest with you. And, and before y'all start sending like messages and text messages and all that stuff, subscribe first. Because if you sending messages and emailing me and ain't subscribed to this channel, I don't really I'm not going to really listen to you as much as I would listen to somebody who would subscribe. Hell, So go ahead and subscribe real quick. Um, and let me just put a disclaimer out. I didn't meet him online. I met him at a conference and I met him in a different light that you may see him. Y'all probably got your own questions and all that. And so if there's something on here that I may not ask and you was like, he should have asked and he should have did that. Um, I grew up in the neighborhood, Berkeley, Missouri. My daddy, 91 years old. I'm a man of principles. I don't get into a whole lot of gossip, but I like to have a real conversation. And so, you know, I challenge you to know that I'm just a virgin to maybe what you know. I know what I would like to know, but if you got something that you would like to know, y'all going to have to hit him on your own because, hell, I didn't get your message before I interviewed him. Is that all right? Good. So the man who's hanging out with me today, if I can be honest with you, he's one of the most controversial people online, but probably one of the nicest people in person. <laughs> the one and only Derek Jackson's hanging out with me. What's going on, champ? It's nothing much, man. You got me over here cracking up with what you just yeah. said, though. But I'm with it. No, because I really don't know. Because, yeah. you know, I, I met you when I was on the road with E.T. and yep. we out speaking and all that. And then I ended up seen a like a, a, a meme a video or mm -hmm. something I was like man that the dude who was at the conference ain't it yeah, and then yeah. I just seen your brand um grow um so the way I like to do this thing on the podcast I like for you to see a portion of last week's show okay. which is a series called love you more uh -huh. I want you to check this out and it's going to kind of be our icebreaker to our conversation okay. conversation okay check this yeah yeah come on yeah feel that in your sha -na -na. so so the so the the way the scene is set up mm -hmm. I'm in it I'm in this relationship and you know I decided to do counseling was counseling an option for you in your marriage first? And if so, was it something that you really wanted to do? Was mm -hmm. it something that you was just kind of like, man, I would, but I won't. Going into the marriage, whenever we were engaged, yeah. uh, we went to premarital counseling. Yeah. And it was really intimidating for me. I didn't know what to expect. Yeah. I'm about to come talk to somebody. 
And I think sometimes we think about counseling, like, oh, you're going to sit down with this professional and they're going to just fix your life. But first, you got to have some type of comfort with that person. You got to feel like you can be fixed. You got to get over pride, any type of narratives that you might have. So, yeah, counseling was an option. We Before um, things went bad in the marriage, we went in already with problems that probably should have stopped us from getting married. Well, and then, you, you, so, so whenever we actually went and sat down with our counselor, honestly, it felt worse. I don't even want to put his name out there, but oh, it was a he. It was a he. Okay. And the way that the session was handled, and I'm not shaming or blaming anything like that, mm-hmm. um, but I don't think he was quite aware of how I was already receiving some of the things that she had to say. Yeah. And it was just her truth and nothing wrong with that. But yeah. the way that I received it actually set things back because I didn't want to go to no more counseling after that one session. I was so, so triggered. So what was, it, what was it about the counseling that kind of made you like, hell, I don't want to do this no more? Was Did he point out something in you that you was like, hold on, this is a biased perspective? Yeah. Or was it was or was it like what was it that made you not want to do it? So first going in, I was desperate. I was desperate, like, you know, I'm doing everything right. We don't came from years of being boyfriend and girlfriend in college, playing mm-hmm. games, all that kind of stuff. So now I'm like, nah, I'm for real. We got a, a little four or five month old or something like that. We got a little baby. Oh, so um, you were pregnant before you got married. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got for it. sure. Okay. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It is what it is. I don't have so, I had one, 21, <laughs> 22. So yeah. we went in at a space where I was like, you know, I really want to do this right. I'm really serious. I done tried everything in my power to please you. At that time, I thought. I could basically kind of perform my way into her love. Okay. If I if I got her the gifts, if I rubbed the back, if I asked her the questions, but it wasn't working. So by the time we got there, I was already beat up. And so when we got in there and then he just let her talk, well, what she had to say and the way that she had to say it, it was tough to hear, mm-hmm. especially in front of a complete stranger. Yeah. And so there was me saying, well, I've been asking you and begging you to tell me what's going on. I would have done anything. Mm-hmm. Why is it that you can open up to him and, and, and trust him with this information? And then what she's saying was really hard to hear because I'm like, I've been in a different space for a very long time, mm-hmm. performative wise. Right. I ain't actually did the deep work, but I, I've been showing up a certain way. Mm-hmm. Um, so in that, I didn't really feel protected, man. And, and, I, and I realized something. Some counselors, like all counselors are not equal. I'm not saying equal and good or bad, but mm-hmm. they do things differently. Mm-hmm. And as for me and where I was at and, and based on where we had gotten to, man, I didn't need that type of counseling. Got so it, it kind of scared me, man. So so kind of bring me back. Like, you know, <clears throat> as I said, I met you, you know, we were doing, you know, personal development and all of that. Mm-hmm. But I never really ever asked you from the beginning. Like I often tell people to understand me, you have to understand that I was adopted when I was three months old by two ex sharecroppers, one from Mississippi, the other one from Louisiana. I grew up in a home where there wasn't a lot of arguing, although I never met anybody in my biological family, you know, until three years ago. Like that kind of molded and shaped the way I dealt with conflict. Of course, I dealt with a whole lot of. Um, you know, a whole lot of just insecurities. I depended on my talent a lot. How did Derek grow up? Like, w- was it a single family home? Like, mm-hmm. how did he grow up? Like, really paint that picture for me so I can understand a little bit about what you saw as a relationship and couple. Yeah, so for me, there's a truth of what it was. And then there was a story okay. that I internalized as a kid. So I grew up in a single parent household. My mama got five children. I'm the youngest of five. Um, she actually moved down from New York whenever I was like one years old and didn't have much money, didn't know anybody, that kind of thing. So my older siblings were the ones that watched us a lot of times. So at this point, I didn't have my dad and my mom was working two or three jobs because she ain't getting, you know, but so much. I think she had a GED at the time. So uh-huh. she wasn't getting but so much money. It's kind of a typical story of a lot of young black African-American males. No mm-hmm. daddy, mama working all the time. Mm-hmm. Um my sisters were the ones I mainly grew up with. My brother was a little older and he kind of was on his way out the house by like six or seven, but it was basically my two elder sisters closer in age and my mama. So I was in a house full of women. So a lot of people ask me now why I'm always speaking up for women. It's like, well, that's why I grew up with. But my mama seemed to connect much better with my sisters than she did with me. And then whenever my mama would come home from work, I mean, of course she's human. She's in her early thirties, she's tired. She just need time to be a human. But a child, we're, we're inherently to a degree narcissistic because we're trying to figure out the world and everything means something about who we are. So mm-hmm. for me, whenever I got tired, mama that already kind of struggled to connect with me, but could you know connect well with my sisters mm-hmm. and daddy ain't there. Meanwhile, other people got their daddies. What I internalized, apart from the truth of the situation, was that Derek's not worthy of love. Derek's Derek's to be rejected. And um, my sister, my closest in age sister, man, she was so, I'm talking about golden child, good at basketball, the grades was right. Meanwhile, me, I always got my mama called from work. I'm trying to get attention through acting up. 
That's, mm. that's how I got everybody to stop and just hear what I had to say. Mm. So uh, the truth of my growing up wasn't really so bad, mm -hmm. but what I identified with was it, it created this void. It's like, I'm always gonna have to try to perform my way into acceptance. Mm -hmm. um, I can expect people to either abandon me or just want to get away from me because I'm so bad. That's all I ever heard. I'm bad. I'm bad. He's bad. Yeah. You know, she tried to find a babysitter. Hey, he's bad. He's going to get on your nerves. So uh, that's what your mom would say. That's not even what my mama would say. OK, this was what everybody else would say. Because okay. she's the thing. She's getting judged. She's a single mother. She got mm -hmm. all these kids. We don't really look that much alike. You know, I'm six, five. I'm dark skin. My next eldest sister, she's five foot two, light skin. Now, you know, we look different. So, you know, just a judgmental society already, you know, and she always needs somebody to keep her kids so she can keep a job. Um, but I'm the one that's hard to deal with. I'm the one that's going to have somebody getting in trouble. Attention. Right, right. So yeah. essentially, man, that was it. Not a lot of money, uh, not a lot of attention. Um, not a lot of connection, even though I had a well-meaning mom. I mean, that's like my superhero. That's my, I love that woman. And I understand now in hindsight what it really was. But as a kid, man, I, I, I identify with a lot of rejection and abandonment. Got it. Yeah. So, so Derek, I want to ask you this, you know, I realize there's no father in the, in the crib mm -hmm. and, you know, I always like to build a bridge of hard conversations with stories. So for me, the only story that I heard about my biological father mm -hmm. was that he mm -hmm. was abusive to my mother. But I had this awesome man whose father was abusive to him, but he did the total opposite with me when he adopted me, Willie J, the best man I ever, I ever known. Can we kind of walk through how you handle handle not having a father? Was mm -hmm. there a was there a male role model? So I want to not make it so deep because I'm gonna be real with you when our social media, mm. not so, not social media, but the live presentation. Mm. So when I seen you on social media, I was like, oh no, he kind of broke real nigga code. Like I was like, you can't tell the business like, cause the OGs would have got on me about like, hey bro, we don't tell that or whatever. So who was the guy mm -hmm. that you kind of looked up to because we mirror 90% of what we do as men from the men that we're around at those really um, pivotal ages of our life. Was it a man in the home or you just never really rock with guys like that and didn't have a person that you really rock with? Yeah, so my dad was out of the picture, I would say about age four. And I always heard that so he So you had first four years with him? First four years. Okay. So I always heard that he loved me and all that kind of stuff. But then when, of course, he wasn't there, I was like, why didn't he love me enough to stick around? Mm -hmm. You know, so again, that was kind of the story of my dad. Of course, there's males around. I mean, I play football. Mm -hmm. There's guys in the church. But ain't nothing like trying to define yourself as a young man, except for by like, OK, what does my dad think of me? What is mm -hmm. the male? Who, who am I really like the, the features on my face? Mm -hmm. uh, my middle name, like that, that guy, what does he think of me? That's that true. was kind of how I define myself. But growing up as far as OGs and stuff like that, man, it was my mama that I saw. I know a lot of people have males, but I'm like, I see my mama putting in work. My mama's the real one. When the storms turn out the lights or, you know, she got to make a hundred dollars stretch for a whole month for groceries. It's my mama I see. So mm -hmm. when I get to talking on any type of subject, that's the that's the viewpoint. It's that's like, I'm going to defend my mama. I'm going to defend my sisters. Right. You know, while a lot of guys thinking bro code, I'm thinking real code. Like the truth is I saw my mama crying from some of the things that guys was doing. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, that don't make me any more perfect or appropriate in how I'm acting, because that's a whole different conversation. But mm -hmm. it was really true to the game. Like when I'm sitting here, they asked me a question about, okay, you know, um, if a woman gets hands put on her by a man, like is she at fault? She did something wrong? I'm like, no, that's crazy. That man made his own decisions. Mm -hmm. So that was the code. I'm like, you know, I'm thinking about it. Not only is my mama like, but my sisters is listening. My future daughters is gonna listen to mm -hmm. this. And really that was my viewpoint. It's like, whether I do good, bad or ugly, it's me making these decisions. It ain't nobody else. And what I saw normalizing these conversations was a lot of projection onto women. It's a lot mm -hmm. of politics. You know, you shouldn't speak so loud and then your man wouldn't do you like this. You should dress differently and then your man would see you as worthy of being faithful too. And it's like with me and all my flaws, I'm like, nah, anytime I did something, I had a choice mm -hmm. and I made my choice and that's the bed I made. So that's kind of the perspective I was coming from, man. I wasn't thinking nothing about no bro code. I yeah. didn't grow up with bros and stuff. Like, no, I, I saw my mom and my sisters going through it. Did and now I got a, a platform. She had boyfriend. She actually had a husband. By the time I was 15, mm -hmm. I had uh, my stepdaddy, Mr. Lloyd. Uh, rest in peace. He actually passed away two years mm -hmm. ago. Um, but that's who taught me how to cut grass, taught me how to change my own oil. He the one that taught me how to roof. I got a roofing and stuff like that. He gave me a lot of that blue collar. I seen the smile come when you talked about Mr. Yeah, Lloyd. Yeah, man. It's like, you know, that blue collar country, man. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And uh he taught me a lot of those principles, but you know, we never really got into like the relationship side of things. Anything relationship, I really got from my mom or, you know, my observation of my mom and my sisters. Did he try or was that just Derek? That really wasn't his forte. You okay. know, he, he wanted them, he, he'd get up six o'clock in the morning, 
He come back home at 6 p.m. or something like that. He tired. He ain't really talking too much. He'll show up. He'll make a joke here or there. We'll go fishing sometime. We'll do things like that. But mm -hmm. not too much birds and the bees talk. Actually, by that time, I probably already done been into birds and bees anyway. So yeah, you know, it starts young when when you know when you're doing your thing. But I do want to kind of get to Mr. Lloyd and mom and relationship. Was it a healthy relationship? Yeah. Because you know when I look at the guy that sometimes you represent of what men should do, mm -hmm. I be looking at him like nigga. That's kind of like a unicorn because I used to be like hell. I can't can't do half the stuff. Like, cause I would watch you like, oh no, she can't watch that one because I ain't doing none of that. <laughs> Hell no, don't post him. Like if, if you pop up on her Instagram, I'd be like, it's gonna be a long week for me. Yeah, you know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, cause yeah. I ain't doing half of that. So was Mr. Lloyd that? Like, where did you get this perception of men if you did not have a male role model that you respected. Coaches were cool. You desired your father, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then you have Mr. Lloyd who goes to work at 6 a.m., comes yeah. home at 6 p.m. Yeah. Um, I would kind of build a bridge because hard conversations require a bridge. I lived in my imagination. No disrespect to nobody who's a janitor or a housekeeper, but my mom and dad, they were housekeepers. Mm -hmm. So I lived in my imagination a lot. Like mm -hmm. I saw all this. I saw movies. I saw radio. I seen music in my head, but none of that was my reality in 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 the in the reality of my now. Yeah. So where did the guy that you represent on social media, mm -hmm. like where did he come from in your heart and your head? Was that something you wish for your mother? Because mm -hmm. Truly, I see now Mr. Lloyd probably wasn't that. No, no, no. So whenever I talk, man, I actually try to keep it separate from me. I God. rarely talked about get like me. I'm this type of person. Right. Um, my platform was largely executive produced by the people who asked me questions. Oh, so if you so ask you me the question, to what I'm a, we were talking about, no, if you want to know the answer, just go in the comments. Yeah, straight like that, you know, yeah. in the DMs or something like that. So if a woman said, well, D, you know, what should I expect on my birthday? Well, I mean, let's, I'm just giving the general. It's just like, well, a man, if he cares about you, he's probably going to remember your birthday, at least make an effort to, even if he's not rich. So I would speak to these things. And now I understand it. It implies this image like, oh, he must be doing every single thing. And I'm like, no, when I come in, I speak, I'm in a completely different space. I'm, I'm, I'm almost approaching it like your big brother, your big cousin. Like, mm -hmm. this is what it is. Mm -hmm. I got my own flaws and hangups, but this is what it is. And I'm going to tell the truth. So I guess you can kind of say like the highest form of conception of as far as how we're supposed to walk was what I was trying to advocate for, which mm -hmm. should be the standard. Even in ways I fell short or other men fell short or realistically we all for, fall short at some point. It was like, well, this is the truth. This is what I'm going to speak on and stand on. And you do what it would do with it what you will. Yeah. So, you know, I look at Derek and I see you totally different because I don't just hang out on social media all the time watching whatever you're saying or what have you. Like I do my best to do my due diligence, due diligence mm -hmm. to connect with you. Um, um, directly, yeah. but I, but I do I do have to know this. I did not watch anything that your wife had the opportunity to say. Not mm. that I did not um, think it was valuable. Not mm. that I didn't want to, you know, maybe hear, you know, her perspective of what have you. Yeah. But I do want to ask you this: when you look at marriage, how does Derek Jack see it now? Like considering that you've been through a lot. Um, I do want to bring this part up. You do have children. How many children do you and her have? I have three children. They're all with her. Six, so, five, and one. Six, five, and one. So you have small children. Um, she's now being extremely vocal about whatever her story is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, everybody gets the opportunity to form an opinion based upon one side of that particular story. Yeah. What scares you the most about the children? What scares me is that you know, they're too young to understand now. My, mm -hmm. my eldest is six. She'll be seven this mm -hmm. year. She already occasionally will, you know, see my face and click on it when she's on YouTube or something like that, just because we share YouTube accounts and stuff. She'll feel like she needs to choose sides. Yeah, that sucks. Because she hears, you know, what mommy is saying, but it's above her maturation to truly understand the nuances. And mm -hmm. it's really not something she's supposed to be in. Mm -hmm. um, or she'll say, you know, daddy, you're bad because, you know, you did this. Or mommy, you're bad because you're saying this about daddy in this space that maybe it shouldn't be. I don't want, like, for mommy and daddy roles, I just feel like that's something the child shouldn't necessarily be exposed to. Mm -hmm. And I fear that we won't be able to necessarily sort that out after mm -hmm. she gets a hold of Google or whatever her friends mm -hmm. is putting her on because she does carry a, a, a name that some people know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's it, man. Other than that, my biggest concern isn't on that. It's more so on their whole normal being blown up. And then how can I make sure that they don't repeat that cycle that I've started? That, that's my biggest thing. It's not even so much um, what Denea said and, and being vocal. Like, you know, she may need to process it however she needs to process it. 
and some of it I ain't gonna like, but that's the bed that I made and I gotta lay in it, you know? But um, my biggest concern with our children is, are they gonna be able to make sense of having their two parents and then not having their two parents? Are they gonna internalize it? Mm -hmm. You know, regardless of the truth, it's again, the story that we tell ourselves is what really shapes our decisions that what imprints on us, just like with me. Yeah. So my biggest concern is how do I try to prevent them from having so much to heal from, from what started with my decisions. What specifically doesn't Derek like about her side of the story? Um, it's not so much that I don't like it. I think whenever either of us, and this including me, when either of us are speaking without the other person, we don't get the full anything. We don't get the full scope. Mm -hmm. I do believe that, you know, whenever she speaks on this, she's speaking from a place of integrity. She's speaking true to her experience. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also coming through a lens of feelings, hurt, uh, missing details, things like that. Um, so the only thing I don't, I don't necessarily think is helpful, that's what I should say, because it's not about me liking, I don't want to police what she's saying, mm -hmm. but I don't think it's helpful for us as now a co-parenting unit to, you know, go out and do things, you know, just one at a time and, you know, this beef and then I'm a counter, I don't like that dynamic. Right. Yeah. So if, if you guys could do it, would you rather you, since it's every, since now it's so vocal, would that be something that you would be open to to like, since we done told everybody, yeah. let's show them the greater good of what we're doing. Would it be something that you would like to do collectively so yeah. you can kind of bounce off? Because I know sometimes when you're dealing it hurt, yeah. you just kind of like, you just going and going yeah. and going. I always tell people it's two things you got to do when you hurt. You got to get stable and you got to get still. Yeah. You know, a lot of times you're not really stable. You're just moving off emotions. And then, you know, you say what you say. You're not thinking about the children. You're not thinking mm -hmm. about grandmama, the yeah. other person. You're not thinking of any of that. You just got to get your truth out. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes it can be detrimental long term as a pertains to the children but are you open to maybe sitting down collectively with her and just saying okay let's really make and let's kind of get to an understanding here yeah that that's actually what uh i asked i asked for that you know i, I wasn't a fan of like i wouldn't be doing this here if it wasn't for you know her joining that conversation or initiating that conversation mm -hmm. um after she did it was extended to me to come out and talk to the gentleman that interviewed her and i said i only want to really do it if mm -hmm. we can get together and talk together yeah. and at least represent a healthy, respectful conversation, maybe hashing some things out. Mm. Um, if it's if it's that necessary or if we feel like we can really help people, um, you know, and, and she wasn't feeling it and that's her right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, man, that's actually what I, I asked for. It was turned down though. What what part of her isn't really feeling it? I didn't watch, but you know, I got producers. He slept with a hundred women. I um I didn't see it, uh, but I used to compare myself to these different women. Um, I went through his phone and I seen A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Like she's very specific about what you were as a husband. Mm. She's so vocal about some of the specifics in your relationship in these. How long you how many long were you married? Married for four and a half years. Well, together for? About 14 altogether. Oh man, out of them 14, I know you were doing something. Oh man. <laughs> so and it was off and on in those 14. Off, yeah, off and yeah. on in them 14. I, if I had to just estimate, I would say I actually together in a relationship, even trying to be some type of monogamous or committed, I'd say about nine years. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We were broken up at the college. We broke up in college. We were just off and on, just couldn't. Stay away from each other, really, though. And you like 30. I'm 34. 34, okay. Yeah, 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 I'll be 34 in a month. But So fairly young guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess you could say that, man. Yeah. So a lot of the activity that she spoke on happened in times where we were single, but some of it did happen while we were together, too. Mm -hmm. She didn't get up there just lying or nothing like that. Um, but for me, man, I'm not a... I'm not a proponent of... Really, bro, I, I believe in family business. Good, bad, and ugly. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no angel in our equation. And, and most people who have been married or any kind of ser serious relationship know this. There ain't no angel and there ain't no devil. There's mm -hmm. two human beings. And when you operate from a hurt place, either mm -hmm. person or both people, like in our situation, you may do hurt, hurtful things. That's not to make no excuses on mm -hmm. my end, her end or anything like that. And I just believe some stuff should be family business. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's like for the stuff that she's done, even on here, I'm gonna be open, but I'm like, I'm not going to go airing out her dirty laundry or what I feel like she did. Mm -hmm. It's just like, what can we take from this? Understanding our children are gonna see this. What can we take from this and grow with into this next chapter? That's my biggest priority. What's Derek's biggest mistake when you look back and say, man, I wish I could have did this just a little bit better. Um, matter of fact, I'll go from bad to good. So the biggest mistake, I would say choosing her from the place that I did. I think I was choosing her to try and rewrite that narrative that I was to be rejected. And I depended on her to, to do some work in me that should have been done 
in my therapist's office, you know, in my prayer closet. It, it, it shouldn't have been love romantically that I was looking for. It should have been healing that I was looking for because mm. this was a narrative that far preceded her. So I ended up hurting her. I'm sure I hurt some of the other women that I dealt with. Um, I brought shame to my family. You know, my son has my name and I got a lot of work to he's do. To give, he's a junior. Wow. So I got a lot to do to try and give something else to be attached to that name when passing down to him. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, when I look back at it, I'm like, it started whenever I fir first chose her. Not that I didn't care for her or love her or anything like that, but I know what I was looking for. So whenever she fell short of that, it was immediate. I'm going to go and try to figure this out now. This, mm -hmm. this role that you wasn't really supposed to be playing in my life, I got to go find something or some people to play that role now. Since you since you just being human and being a woman and figuring life out on your own and just mm -hmm. trying to be my romantic partner instead of this void filler, mm -hmm. now I'm going to go do this. And it was a lot of pattern. It wasn't just like repeated. It wasn't just repetitive decision. It was, it was really a long pattern mm -hmm. and failed attempts to correct that pattern. Again, performance based. And, you know, I'm a fit. You can't learn character. You got to train character, though. That's good. I'm going to give you a bill on that. You, yeah, you got you yeah. got to heal into that. You got to practice that. It's got to become a part of you. Right. Um, so that's the biggest thing. But then there are some things, man, I look and I say, well, when I wasn't in survival mode, mm -hmm. when I wasn't triggered, I did show up as a, as a man that I would hope my daughter one day marries as I wish my mama had had and my daddy. Um, you know, I'm not about to pat myself on the back, but there were times where I would come through with her. I would sacrifice my last for her, mm -hmm. um, where I came forward with any type of ugly truth before it, where it was anything to find out. Mm -hmm. For many months, sometimes years, I actually walked according to what I was talking in my relationship. And I'm like, okay, well, how do I build on that now? Mm -hmm. that's, that's where I'm at because I think we all on the journey trying to figure it out. I love it. Derek Jack's hanging out with me. You know, you talked about Lil Derek, and I seen the change in your stature. I just want to kind of play a little dress up, if you would. How old is Lil Derek now? He's five. He just turned five. Good Up stuff. That's stuff. a real good age. That boy jumping on everything. He's everything. trying to figure it out. He got this genuine look in his eyes, you know, and you kind of looking for signs when he walks in to see if some of the stuff that's been said is actually getting to his heart. When he gets there... He's running around and you try to make every moment the best that you can because you understand that there's a lot of things that a mama influences on the child. They often say that there's mama's boys and daddy's girls. Mm. What do we say to Derek, little Derek, when he turns 12 years old and he's starting to get into that middle school age where he matures a little bit and he's trying to make sense of why daddy's over here, mama's over there. Why does the world want to know so much about our family? And then by the time 12, he's kind of formed his own opinion. How do we steer little Derek in the right direction so he doesn't make, doesn't have to jump so many hurdles as big Derek did and mama had? Like, Man. what's the advice that you'd give to that 12-year-old Derek? Man, you want to know something? A lot of people look to me because I got a lot of answers and that's one of them I don't have. That's one of the things that keeps me up at night. That's one of the things that kept me fighting for the marriage the last couple of years when I felt like it was really over is understanding at some point he's gonna have questions I can't answer. I wasn't in that situation. You know, my, my daddy again from age four pretty much wasn't there. My mom and daddy was never married. Um, I wasn't even in the house whenever he was there. But when I look at him and I, and I see, he's already affected, by the way. He's five years old and he'll ask, why aren't you and mommy married anymore? No, son, we, we, we're friends. Why do you guys have to be friends? Are you guys want to live together as friends? And I can tell he's struggling with it because I went from having the children every day. I wake up, you know, sometimes I'm bringing them to school, I'm getting them from school, I'm putting them to bed, I'm making them oatmeal, I'm this, that, and the mm -hmm. other, disciplining them. Mm -hmm. uh, in any type of spare time, they come and climbing on me. Mm -hmm. And now we go from 100% to 25% of the childhood is what I get. Yeah. Every other weekend, Thursday through Monday morning, um, instead of 30 days a month, seven days. And it's not, I, I mean, of course, we take a loss as men, as fathers in this situation, but their dad, their superhero, mm -hmm. is the one that got taken from them. Yeah. And um, especially in the first couple of months after we split, he was having behavioral problems, and, and I knew exactly what that was. Mm -hmm. So when you... I love the fact that you were honest, like, bro, I ain't really got the answer to that one. And I just want to tell you that your father didn't have the answers for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think there's a level of grace that we have to maybe have for those that we still have anger for because they could have did better. 
So I finally met my biological father after 40 years. I got my hood way. It's like the devil over here. And then I got God way and I give him that grace. And I decided to give my dad that grace. And I looked him in the face and I said, I release you. Like I release you. I know none of your children ever pursued you, but I'm gonna call you every single week. Although in my head, I think as a father, you should probably be pursuing me, but I'm a Christian now. And so at the end of the day, I'm gonna call you every single week. He was just at the hotel at the Rich with me in St. Louis. We spent, spent a cool little night together, hooked it up and did whatever. And I released him. And I just feel like in this moment, like there has to be an opportunity because when I look at your spirit, I think you'll always have this thing on the inside. It's just like, look at the, look what you missed out on. Mm. Look what you missed out on. Like the reason why I became pretty willy and became successful because I wanted to show my mama, look what you missed out on. Because I became this Christian guy, everybody celebrating me. I was like, look what you missed out on. And then I, and then I meet him and I realize, Man, the folks, man, they had their own personal issues, problems, and things, and I was able to release them. Now my mother and my mama, they like best friends. Yeah. My daddy can actually smile around me because they know I don't, I don't hold any airs. I'm talking to you as a person who has no freaking judgment because we all men. Everybody around the world can say whatever they choose to say. I choose to build a bridge with a person who's literally saying, damn, I didn't, and I'm not giving, like, people like, well, he gave him an escape. I don't care what you say. What I'm saying is, Man, our foundation is so broken and sometimes we hold on so tight to that and we attempt to make this beautiful ready-made family without necessarily having the tools that it takes to really build a strong foundation because our shit is so warped. Let me say this though, Willie. Ain't no escape whenever your children can't make sense of their new normal. Yeah. When they miss you and you can't do nothing about it. Yeah. When they when they crying on Christmas because they can't see you because you alternating holidays now instead of That's you know weird. matching pajamas and you got the you know presents and all that kind of stuff. Ain't ain't no escape. Yeah. Um damn the public. In real life, I broke these children's heart. And I gotta live with that. Yeah. Um, when he has behavioral issues, I know because I was him having behavioral issues, really not knowing how to express what was wrong with me because you don't have the equipment, you don't have the words to say, I'm hurting inside, I'm grieving this change, I'm confused, I feel helpless, I'm voiceless. You don't have that at four or five years old. Um, and I'm seeing it. And, and I know that even in good intention, his mother first was thinking, I got to discipline him. I got to be tough, you know, because yeah. it's just me that mostly that got the kids and stuff. And I'm saying, no, bring them over here. But we we so not in a good place where I might not get a text or a call back or anything like that. So he's in that situation and it's not her fault. There yeah. ain't no escape knowing that it's your fault. Yeah. You could have prevented all of this, if not most of it. Man, I yeah. feel like you triggering me right now. Yeah. And you know something, like I said, this is a long pattern. I don't got no shame in it, man. Like this wasn't my first time falling like this. Um, but at 25, I went and I met my dad for the first time since I was a little boy. Mm -hmm. He's in Jamaica. He couldn't, he can't come back to the States because, you know, he got his stuff going on or whatever. But, and I did the same thing. I forgave him. Mm -hmm. And I thought because I forgave him, that released me from the impact his absence had on me. Mm -hmm. And it didn't. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I forgive you. But now I got to rework everything that got messed up in me not having you. Mm -hmm. And I skipped that part. And that's where really my whole career started. It was like, oh, I'm good. Now I'm released. I feel good. You got this emotional high. I got the woman of my dreams. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm ready to mm -hmm. do this. Right. And then I, and I started on this trek of like, okay, now I'm going to go and teach the world and help the world. But from an authentic place, because I've done the work. And yeah. then that, that, that version of me that still needed him, mm -hmm that never really died because you got to rewrite that stuff. You got to rewire that stuff. And again, that takes time. That takes practice. That takes being challenged with some things that normally would have you relapsing, but you, you substitute it with something that you can feel integral behind. Right. Um, that's what I learned, man. And, and we talk about that so much, childhood mm -hmm. issues. Forgive your parents. Don't just forgive your parents. You also now got to clean up the mess that their absence or whatever their behavior yeah, towards you made. So I heard you, you just said, I finally married the girl of my dreams. Yeah. How to talk about the good times when she was the girl of your dreams, because ultimately the picture that has been painted now is that she's never really been the girl of your dreams because you always had something else going on inside 
of the marriage. Can a man have the girl of his dreams and still have alternate activities mm -hmm. outside of what marriage looks like? Talk to me about that time when she was really the girl of your dreams. Yeah, well. More Love You More podcast after this. Hey guys, Khalil Moore here with The More Mentorship, and I'm here to tell you about what The More Mentorship is. We're here to influence your kids and be successful young men in life. Make sure you enroll your students at morementorship.com. Love you more, love you more, love you more. Now back to the Love You More podcast. So I heard you just said, I finally married the girl of my dreams. Yeah. How to talk about the good times when she was the girl of your dreams. Cause ultimately the picture that has been painted now is that she's never really been the girl of your dreams because you always had something else going on inside of the marriage. Can a man have the girl of his dreams and still have alternate activities mm -hmm. outside of what marriage looks like? Talk to me about that time when she was really the girl of your dreams. Yeah, well, I definitely made that hard for her to believe or to know, you know, with my outside activities. It wasn't always like that. There was just many times it was just me and her, but too often a, a blurring that line, a crossing that line, I couldn't understand that would confuse anybody. Mm. Um, but that was absolutely the girl, man. I, I felt like at home wow. with her. I felt like that was my best friend. You know, when we first got together, we could just laugh. It's like she just brought out the kid in me. It was safe. It wasn't judged. Um, matter of fact, our first date, man, I had enough money to take her. Uh, I had gas and, and, and to get her food afterwards. I didn't even have enough for myself. And we went to IHOP, man, and I, um, I ate water for dinner. I was yeah. just so happy to be on a date with her, but she didn't trip. I didn't mm -hmm. know she had like $15,000 in her account. <laughs> some other stuff. She had money, man, but right. she didn't judge me. Right. You know, even in college, you know, there was that whole thing. Man, you're supposed to have money, da, 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 da. And, and from there, man, I just remember feeling safe. I felt at home. Um, that was my dog. And, and she was beautiful to me. You know, I think she's still a beautiful woman. Um, she didn't have to be no Instagram perfect or anything like that. Mm -hmm. it, it just felt like this feeling that I have with her, I want this for the rest of my life. Wow. And it was this struggle though of, of staying in that place because, you know, she's human. And again, I'm not going to say no longer, but I will say this, because I think this is something maybe some people can get some value from. She, as a human, has times where she's handling life the best way that she knows how. Yeah. And that don't necessarily serve me or don't feel good. Yeah. And one of those ways would be that she would just honestly, she would kind of shut down. She needed to withdraw in order to come back to a good place. Mm -hmm. She couldn't talk. She couldn't engage. And I got a, a slightly different, well, a vastly different version of her. Mm -hmm. So instead of having the maturity to understand like, okay, she's fighting whatever battle she got. She's learning life just like I am. We 19 years old, we're growing up together, all of this other stuff. She got trauma. At that time, I didn't know about some of them. I personalized a lot of it. Mm -hmm. and, and because my particular wounds myself were abandonment and rejection, it felt like a repeat of, and I didn't know this was at a subconscious level, but it felt like a repeat of. Yeah. Um, but man, in between being triggered, I'm talking about like, man, family members passing away and she had, she had every funeral. Any family member of hers, we, I'm at every funeral. You know, cooking for her on, on, on uh, her birthday, anniversaries, we celebrating and you man, you know, being broke together, but then making a whole lot of money together, getting her dream car when she used to let me use her car. And, yeah. you know, it's, some of this stuff may sound superficial, but a lot of it started as like just a vision we had as teenagers uh, when she had the money and I didn't. We were mm -hmm. splitting Raymond noodle packets whenever we both got broke mm -hmm. and me telling her, man, you hold it down. Watch what I'm going to do. First, I thought it was going to be football. But I was like, so you play ball in college? In college, that's how I went yeah. to college. It was a scholarship. Your arm's still bigger than mine. I put a jacket on. I was like, hell no, ain't no way. I'm wearing my little t-shirt today. He pulled his and man, arm big as my thigh. We praying. Hey man, yeah. I was and, and and I was just okay in college for being real. Yeah, but she believed in me, and <sighs> and a lot of times that was my motivation to like, man, I got to really figure this out. And when I couldn't figure that out, like I got to figure something out. And as I actually figured it out, and the money was coming in, because I. I proposed to her whenever I had my best financial year ever. And I was like, I don't want to restart with nobody else. I don't want somebody else who looks better. No, I want the girl that I was broke with, that I was in college with. And that's when I proposed to her. And it was, it just seemed like the dream was coming true, but you know what? There was a lot of work that needed to be done, man, to see that through. And I didn't get it done. So, so why divorce? Why was divorce an option when you feel the way you feel kind of on the, like this side? Like when you speak about her, 
Like, I think everybody in the room can see that you light up. Like, you really like kind of light up when you talk about it. And so so walk me through the divorce journey, because it's a lot of people right now who may light up exactly like you, but then choose divorce. Are there any regrets? Um, I won't say regrets. I, I think regrets kind of waste the opportunity to learn and move forward more productively. Yeah. Um, it's just that no matter what happened, what we went through, it's not going to negate that, you know, she really tried to love me and she tried to lo love versions of me that wasn't easy to love. Um, so if you, anybody asks me about her, I'm not going to take nothing away from her just because things did go sour. Mm -hmm. So as far as the actual divorce, um, like what was the time when you just like, I can't do this, no man, before we even got married, before we went to counseling, I was mm -hmm. like, I've showed up as who I said I would show up as mm -hmm. I'm a present father. I'm faithful at this time. Like I've cut, I've cut everything off. I've done what I said I would do coming from boyfriend, girlfriend time to now we're supposed to be doing this grown man. And I'm still getting the same results. I'm still getting shut out. I'm still getting treated a certain way, talked to a certain way. In, in my opinion at the time, I was getting emasculated. I was getting talked down to. Um, and again, hindsight is twenty twenty. I understand a little bit now. So what type of things triggered you in that, that regard? So you don't have to go back into it in, in your next relationship or the reconciliation of you guys. Who knows? You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. I, I, oh, you, so no. <laughs> was it? No, I'm no, just no, be no. real. Like, yeah, no, no. no. But I will say this. The, the main recurring thing um, for us, I won't say anything specific because, again, I don't want to, like, put nothing out there too crazy. But it was being shut down whenever I was really trying to understand her. And I would say, what's wrong? Like, am I doing something wrong? Do you need space? Do you need? And there was um, this real cold feeling of energy. rejection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, energy for sure. Mm -hmm. And, you know, of course, it, it translated into the sexual whatever. But that wasn't the most of it. The, the real most of it was like, you won't even talk to me. You, you, you treat me like I'm a germ. You can't get far enough away from me in, in the house. Like, what's going on? Was, do you want somebody else? Have I done something? And me, I'm knowing... Hey, I'm walking a straight line out here and I'm providing. You don't have to work and this, that and the other. Some of that is ego. But then some of that is just my expectation of, hold on, I'm supposed to get received here. Mm -hmm. And month after month of that, again, I'm taking it way more personal than what I should. Yeah. Not that she handled everything perfectly. And I don't think that she would even say she handled it perfectly. But mm -hmm. there wasn't enough space for her to be processing things, figuring it out. There wasn't enough long suffering on my end because I was already suffering before I even met her. Mm -hmm. So that just internalizing that rejection, um, which was really a lot of abandonment being triggered over and over again mm -hmm. and really overly dependent on her to be the soothing of that in the first place when she never should have been. That's what went to like, OK, now I'm in survival mode. Like I've tried everything. And instead of just leaving with integrity and, you know, dignity, I'm sitting here trying to stay attached and so on and so forth. Did you stick around too long? Way too long. I think we both did. If, if I'm being honest, we both did. Going into the marriage, there was a lot of these things presenting themselves as like unresolved. This is gonna be bad. But now you got fear of what everybody gonna think. You know, yeah. I done proposed in front <laughs> of her family. You know, I got yeah. a mama to fly out of this other stuff. So um, it's just like, no, we're gonna figure this out because at this point we got a little baby. And a lot of the reason, if I'm being honest, of the timing of me proposing to her had to do with we had a child. We we like my, my baby was about three months. My my mm -hmm. eldest daughter was about three months old whenever I proposed. Mm -hmm. And again, I wanted to be that dad in the home. I don't know about you, but I always had this like, oh, you know, I didn't have my daddy growing up, so I'm gonna be that one that breaks that curse. I'm gonna be in the home. Yeah, definitely. You just know you're gonna do it, right? Yeah. So whenever that happened, it was definitely. like, nah, I'm about to do this. I actually was still in my whole phase of we being really real. Yeah. Like, you know, we were single at the time. We actually conceived my, my eldest daughter. So you, um, so is that kind of what, because I didn't, let me just say this in the camera. Hell, I didn't see it. I want to tell you. So when she talked about Derek was with like, I, what the hell did y'all tell me? He's with a hundred uh, girls, um, hundred girls. And then he, he, uh, she, will, she stole your phone and she was looking and she was like, I'm comparing myself to, to the women. Like she, I didn't watch the full interview myself. I, I couldn't. So it. so she steal your. You remember when she took the phone the same I know, video? Uh, most of the stuff, the clips I saw, I've, I've heard at some point. Now the hundred women thing that was not quite how it went. There was a hundred women total, and I hate that I'm discussing my sexual history before, during, and after her. Um, but a that lot was, of that was really good how you said that. The, that bothers you. That bothers them right there. Like how the hell are we talking about who? Like I, I really, with? I really, I think she said names too. By the way, but I ain't seen. Well, I didn't even want to get into. Because I, I don't want to go tit for tat. I don't want to go um, fact checking everything that she said, even though a lot of it, I'm like, that ain't how it went. Because, man, I'm just keeping it real with you, really. She heard me say a lot of stuff on my platform that wasn't aligned with how I was moving at times and didn't say anything. 
So I don't want to get up here saying, well, yeah, this yeah, is a lie yeah, and no. that's a lie. No, no, that's real. I'll I'll speak to that though. It wasn't a it was a it was a lot of those women were in the times where we were single and we were both very single. We were both single. It wasn't just me. Got it. We were both single. Got and it. nothing that she did was wrong in that time. And I felt like nothing I did was wrong in that time. But when we got back together, yeah, she saw these videos and stuff like that. From when you were single. When we were single. Got it. Good. But now the, the thing was, I was um, engaging with these women while she was also carrying our baby. And that's what really, really got her upset. Not only that, she saw this while she was pregnant. So you can only imagine. What did you do to comfort her during that time? Or did you have the Man, there was I just bit? took everything. She called me every name in the book, understandably, but it was nothing I could do. It was just like, I really, really dropped the ball on this. Yeah, I'm single or whatever, but I'm also careless. I'm also mm. irresponsible. You know, when she first said she was pregnant with our baby, I was like, oh, I'm gonna take care of you, even though we're not together. Mm -hmm. You ain't gotta work no more. I just, you know, I'm gonna jump into this mold. Mm -hmm. But I was taking care of her on that level while leaving her wide open to harm on the other. You know, emotionally, mentally, that's that's mm -hmm. traumatic to see that, you know, while you got a baby in your stomach, this this man that, you, you know, what I'm saying is out here engaging with these women, regardless of relationship status or title, like you could have a little bit more respect mm -hmm. for your forthcoming child than that. And I didn't. So I could understand her being a, not just upset. I can understand her really being deeply hurt and disappointed. Um, but it wasn't 100 women during the time that we were dating. A lot of that happened before her, before I ever met her, while we, you know, so. Yeah. Derek, I got to ask you this. Can Derek Jacks, number one, live up to the standard that you've put into the earth? Is that a goal? And can Derek Jacks be faithful in his next relationship according to the standard in which you put on social media? So I'm gonna answer number two first. Absolutely. Um, the part about me not being faithful was really about breaking a, a, a habit, a pattern mm -hmm. of what I do whenever I feel, again, Reject. the most rejected mm -hmm. and the most abandoned. Um, some type, whether it was because before it was women or when it wasn't women, it was porn. It was it was some type of connection. Even if it wasn't sexual, it would be something. I would have to go and do that because it's much easier than coming back and restoring and repairing whatever happened. And the reason why I can't do that is because I'm not coming from a healthy place to begin with. Mm -hmm. And when you're in that survival mode, and a lot of people are going to disagree with it, but when you're in that survival mode, you don't care about right and wrong. You care about making it the next hour, the next three hours. When you're in that Some fight or flight, will, you I feel- I think most men- Yeah, you, you, feel, you feel how you feel and you, you can't think straight, you can't sleep. And you thinking it's just because your wife ain't acting right mm -hmm. or because she been you know resentful or whatever. And it's like, nah, man, that's something much deeper. And that ain't her work to do in order to keep you from doing whatever you're thinking about doing, whatever you're most familiar with. That's really on- you now knowing how to regulate and then deal with that narrative and then come back and do something that's not going to complicate your life even more. Mm -hmm. um, so it was really, man, in the last couple of years of our marriage where not only I learned that, but it really got tested. I never got treated more disgusting, like I'm disgusting to her, more repulsive to her than what happened in the last couple of years of the marriage. So what made you disgusting? Was something discovered or was it just Well, like it was just a lack of safety. Okay. I think to, to any woman, man, you know, you can go from the one that she love, her king, to a complete scum on the bottom of her shoe yeah. if she no longer feels safe with you. Mm -hmm. And so for us, that's that's what happened, man. I ruptured the safety. And then whenever it hit the Internet, it was humiliation to our family, friends, old co-workers, everybody like nothing. I don't I don't wish on my worst enemy. Mm -hmm. um, so I could understand her not feeling me or what have you. But this was the first time that I stayed put. So all of this stuff comes out the first time. And I just remember like a video and she was just kind of sitting there numb and you was talking and we're, and I was just kind of looking like, man, I don't know if that was a good idea to like put yeah. her in front of a camera when she's not the camera person all the time. Right. Whose right. idea was that to just kind of collectively as a family? Was that something that you seen in your heart and your head to do? Well, we talked about it, but I allowed her to be in that moment and I never should have. Um, man, that was literally 48 hours after coming back from my dad's uh, 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 funeral. We had so just came back. Remember I told died. you my stepdad? Oh, my yeah, stepdad, yeah, 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 yeah. He yeah. passed away two years ago. Uh -huh. yep. This was like at his uh, Passover. That's when all, all the stuff originally was kind of going viral. Okay. You know, so we rushed back home and then we did the video. Um, and she basically just had the mindset of, hey, I've stood with you. You know, everything that's coming out, you already told me. I'm going to stand with you in so public. So you had already told her everything. I'm gonna stand, yeah, I'm going to stand with you in public. Um, in hindsight, I'm like, if I had known that what came from that her way was going to come, I would have never let her be a part of that moment. My thought process was, okay, this ain't just my experience no more. 
Mm-hmm. This is our family. We are married. This is something I did to her. You know, I, she needs to have a voice. Mm-hmm. If she wants a voice, she needs to have a voice and then she could speak for herself instead of me just speaking again for her and leaving her voiceless. Um, but a lot came her way, man, from that. I didn't know it was going to come. I guess I should have, but either way, I didn't put her in position to win. Were you only thinking about Derek? Like, I got to make sure that I save face for the brand or you ain't had nothing in there that had any selfish motives in it? I, in, in the moment, man, before we even did it, first off, I'm grieving. I just Definitely. saw my stepdad, the one who was actually there. Six to six. That's what I call For the him. very last <laughs> time, man. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I'm seeing him cold. I'm seeing him great. I'm, I'm looking at this man that was there in my high school years that, you know, we had, we had a decent relationship. We went through some stuff and patched it up. So there was a lot of feelings because of that. There was a lot of feelings because in real life, we had already been separated and came back from all of this stuff. We already, we had separated maybe the the year and some change prior, eight months. And I was in the process of showing her, like, I don't want to just talk it. I want to show you where my heart is at. I've really done the work and I'm ready to put it in practice. I'm ready to be the leader this family deserves. So we're, we're in the middle of a lot of shaky stuff. And I think, man, but then the week before that, we had just found out our third child was on the way. There was so much going on. It was, it was kind of numb. Right. Um, and so I you was, guys get on there like we got on there and it was just like, you know, I'm not about to hide from this because of all the rumors and stuff that's been said. This part is true. At least some of it's true. The Internet is just going to always exaggerate. But I'm like, some of it is true. And the people that have made me who I am, who have built this platform, they deserve for me to face them. The only thing is, this doesn't just involve me no more. It involves her. So, you know, we did the video. And again, I was kind of numb. I'm like, you know, they're going to I know what's coming my way and I deserve every bit of it. I know the means. I already knew that was coming. Mm-hmm. Um, where I stopped being numb is when I saw her receiving all kind of stuff because of what she wore, things like that. And I'm like, they don't know one. This is a pregnant woman. Um, I don't think they even care that this is a traumatized woman right now. Not just uncomfortable on camera. She's still healing from her trauma. I'm trying to prove myself. She's trying to pick herself back up and not even all the way sure of what I'm on because she's trying to see it in real time and evaluate. Mm-hmm. Um, so afterwards, man, when it all is coming, I'm just like, not, like it was already bad. Now it's worse. Mm. And I felt every bit of that because now she can't be what she normally would be even for our children. Of course, she's pregnant. She's carrying one. Um, but I'm like, regardless of how I feel, I got to step in now and be the primary parent for our elder two children. Because she needs time, need time to rip. She needs time just to be, man, probably just to keep herself together and get up every day and give life a shot. To be real with you, you know. That's um, got to be a lot. I wouldn't wish it on nobody, man. Um, what type of things do you say to a woman who's now been publicly scrutinized to maybe possibly build her up? More Love You More podcast after this. You know, all relationships start off beautiful. The love is so intense in the beginning until life happens. No matter how disciplined you are, Temptation is everywhere, and we all have to fight with our internal monsters. And sometimes, we fall into the trap, and we hurt the ones we say we love the most. As you get older, loved ones pass away, and you're left to live life with a void that you never really anticipated. For some reason, people never talk about the parts of you that die when your loved one leaves the earth. It's so easy to lose who you are in the midst of all of this. I lost myself because I forgot to love myself. I'd like to take you on a journey in hopes that you can learn how to love you more. Wow. To check out the first episode, log on to loveyoumore.com. Love you more. Love you more. Love you more. Now back to the Love You More podcast. Um, what type of things do you say to a woman who's now been publicly scrutinized to maybe possibly build her up? It kind of depends because I'm the same person that put her in that situation. Dang. So it's like a powerlessness. You know, it's like, I don't know if you ever did something in emotion. And when you did it, it made sense. But then afterwards, you're like, man, what am I doing? What the hell but, would I do? Yeah. But, right. mm-hmm. So I'm in this sober state now. You know, I've, uh, I've, I've, like now, like I'm talking, let's say like a month after and all of this stuff is going on, you know, everybody's coming at her. Normally, I'm the voice that stands up for that voiceless woman 
that's been hurt at the hands of a big bad yeah, wolf. Yeah, because you're going to do it. But now I'm the, but I'm if the dog. If you got a man who will put you in front of a camera and tell <laughs> right. you to sit there you next know, to me, then and that the worst guy part is, is not. Really, I, tried, I tried that. And it didn't work. <laughs> that didn't Talk, work man, either. third person was the worst thing. I got called every <laughs> narcissist. I was like, yeah, that ain't working either. But I was really, <laughs> I was really desperate for somebody. When I did see people defending her, I was grateful because I'm like, I'm I'm powerless in this, man. Mm -hmm. I, I'm the one that did this to her. Mm -hmm. I done protected all of these women and I can't protect the one that's in my life. I haven't protected the one that's in my life. And she needs protecting more than ever now. Yeah. To some degree, I think she was trying to protect me by even sitting on that couch with me at that time to like, show, I, I think that was a form of protection. Like, you know, no matter how hurt I am, I'm showing that what he's saying, I, I already knew and, and you know, we standing together and here I am and she needs somebody to protect her and I couldn't. Jeez. And I don't care what type of stuff she did, you know, that was also hurt, whatever. She didn't deserve that, man. You got a napkin for, for him real quick. It's a napkin, anything. Yeah. If you, um, I, you know, I appreciate you sharing that vulnerability. Um, however, they always throw around. I mean, I know how much you care about them kids. I know how much you care about her. You know, definitely got love for her for sure. You know, it's like, yo, I got number love for you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I often hear the word narcissist thrown around in certain situations. Yeah. You know, I wrote a marriage book, um, a very, very vocal ex-spouse about, oh, well, he did this and he did that. And it was almost like I had to come clean on my radio show to say, Hey, I wrote a marriage book because there were some things in the marriage that I really felt could work for other marriages that we got correct. Yeah. Um, and then ultimately I wrote a marriage book because I knew that if I could teach couples and it's really crazy when you're a visionary because it don't necessarily sound right. I guess it could be nar narcissistic, but I'm just like, if I can teach couples how to be stronger, I can help more foster kids and adoptive kids get stronger homes. So if I can just pull all of the good that we got, although it is a gang of stuff that we got wrong, if I can yeah. put that in literary form and put it in a book and teach people how to have strong relationships, when I say, hey, you want to have a child in your home? It's 123,000 kids out here who actually need a home. They about to age out of foster care. Mm -hmm. Then it works. How do you deal with the word narcissist being thrown around your way because you presented a message of hope for women all around the world and yeah. couples for all around the world. And then come to find out Derek loves his wife, but he also enjoys his fun. Mm -hmm. Well, as far as the narcissist word, um, man, I'm kind of used to being called something just because <laughs> of my, just, just, be, just telling the truth is going to get you called names. Like, let's yeah. be real. If I was Jesus Jr., Telling the yeah. truth, I yeah. would have gotten called a lot of names this entire time. Yeah. Whenever you start telling the truth, those who who benefited from the lie will come for you. Yeah. So I'm used to being talked about. I'm used to being called something. Um, honestly, narcissist is the hot word. If you if you look, anybody Google's how much NPD, narcissistic personality disorder, affects Americans at least. It's like one percent of the population. It's like saying like somebody called me like, oh, you got Ebola. Like it's so actually rare the actual disorder, but we all have narcissistic traits. Yes. So in the time of me lying, in the time of be, me betraying, in the time of me, whether neglecting my responsibilities or, or whatever, that was all narcissistic. So anybody that said, you know, what I did was narcissistic would be absolutely correct. There's, mm -hmm. there's, there's no protest from me. We on the same page. And for me, my whole goal is how can I take out any narcissistic relational style of engagement with my partner out of the equation so I can be a healthy contributor to a relationship. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not accountable to comment sections on gossip blogs. I'm not accountable to anybody that's talking. I'm accountable to the people I, I make vows to the woman I make vows to, to the children I'm supposed to be modeling, um, to my mom who I always talk about as my superhero, but here I am yeah. misrepresenting even how she see? raised me. What's your mama say? Oh, my mama, man, my mama's just- What's your mama like, mama? My mama, was, she ain't one of them that's cool with whatever nonsense. Okay. You know how some moms coddle their sons? Yeah, hell, I think I'm coddled. Yeah. <laughs> But <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you. My mama like, he didn't really, I could rob a bank. And my mama be like, well, hell, this thing was, he 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 <laughs> he, he had took some medicine. Hey, look, You know he took some medicine? Man. And what happened with the medicine was, oh, your mama it, it had messed him up, his, <laughs> the serotonin in his brain. You know, my mama going to ride for me. What your mama said Man, when all this came out? My mama just wanted to make sure mentally I was okay. That was That's her good. whole thing. Yeah. Right, wrong, or otherwise, are you okay? 
Yeah. Because it's a lot that no matter how wrong you are, this is her thing. No matter how wrong you are, a lot of people can't handle what's coming their way and, and everybody ain't against you. That was my, you thing. know, so she knew what I had done, but she also knew I wasn't what I had done. Are you OK? Am I OK now? Yeah, I'm getting there. I can't say OK in the sense of like fully over everything, fully processed, because I think divorce, especially if you're the reason for it or if you at least know that you played a major part in it. It's it's the, probably the only thing I would say is more painful than losing a family member. Because you die that death over and over again when you see your children. When you, when, uh, you know, holidays, I, I didn't get to see my youngest daughter for over a month, man. Um, and a lot of that wasn't necessarily supposed to happen, but I understand, a, a, you know, she's trying to figure it out. Danae's trying to figure it out as well. Like just that discord. Again, I, I always look back to where it started. It started with Adam. You know, we biblical, I started with Adam. It didn't start with Eve. Um, you die that death every time you come to that empty house. You know what I mean? Like, when you when when your daughter got to go to urgent care for something she done did and you only you can only call you only can phone call because y'all really ain't supposed to be around each other you know so uh that is something i don't know when i'll be okay from but that's why i'm still accountable to my my accountability partners and my therapy and the things that i did to even get to this point yeah that one kind of struck a nerve with me because that's the hardest part for me like them children like People often ask me, and I say it by faith, that I never had it so good. When I think about those children, it's like, and seeing the pain that they have to go through in their eyes because their normal has not been crushed. And although I know I made the right decision, I know in all of my heart that I made the right decision. And it still just hurts so much to know that I'm attempting to create something that's remotely different from what they see on television. And I just wanted to kind of insert that right there because when I called you after all this stuff came out, because I called you to make sure you're okay. Yeah. Because I don't really care about what people think about you as a brand. I think about you as a person because I know anybody who can be crucified can be resurrected. Yeah. And so I'm always calling um, because what people don't know is that you ain't always been a believer. Right. We connected once you became a believer. Yep. And... You was trying to navigate and figure things out like, OK, I was living a cool life and then I get with Jesus and like all this stuff started happening. And I'm just like, I'm I'm in the race like, come on, stay with Jesus, brother. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm doing everything that I can to make sure that you're not going into some hole or or, you know, are you OK? Are you good? And and I think the last time we, we had a conversation, I had no idea all the foolishness was going on because I keep my head down yeah. and you like call like, let's go work out. And I'm just like, well, bro, I got a meeting and, da, 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 da. and then all this crap comes out. And although there may be some truth to it, I'm just like, he's a human who is attempting to be a Christian and he's fairly new to this walk. And the only thing that we can never hear about publicly is number one some of the things that he did in the past and then the struggles that he's having in the future i sometimes want to get up and like y'all know i was pretty willy don't it? i was thinking lay your body down four <laughs> walls black and my butt wise and still walk around know. with a pistol daily that's how i met you uh <laughs> come across you yeah i told you that but yeah we, we keep that off of here, yeah buddy. like no like and it's good but it's like we all have a past i just don't feel like we got to be prisoner to it absolutely like i don't want to be a prisoner to that and i just want to tell you like i you know, I want you to walk upright as a man. I want you to be faithful to your family. I know sometimes branding kind of makes us be something. And that's what this podcast is about. And, and listen, by no means am I trying to take up for wrong ever. Mm -hmm. But I'm just saying, men, we don't communicate like that. But women have the innate ability to communicate anything that they feel. And as men, we'll sit back like... Well, you know what happened? And we're going to be diplomatic about it. I think sometimes bloggers and people, they forgot that it's skin, heart, soul, spirit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but let me tell you something, man. I've been on both sides of it. I've been a part of the, the judgmental crowd. And uh, especially even for the for the Christian community, it's one particular person, we ain't going to say his name, but, um, you know, that I judged. Even though I wasn't trying to judge, I, and I was judging them. Yeah. And what I'll say is this, even for the people that judge now or what have you, a lot of it is projected. Like for me, whenever I would judge, I was I was trying to distance myself from something that I held shame about, that I saw in them that was really a part of me as well. Yeah. So even the people that I judged, I didn't even think this human, I wasn't thinking necessarily about them. I was thinking from this place right here. Mm -hmm. So some people they've been through it and some people they're doing it themselves. 
But what, you, what a lot of times what we're trying to do is create this dissonance. We're trying to create this distance from that negative thing because then it makes us feel like a better person. Mm -hmm. You know, so even for the people that have judged harshly and wrongly the Christians and whoever else, man, I have a I have a certain level of empathy for them because I'm like, man, I remember what it was like pointing my finger at somebody who did some wrong. You know, I'm thinking I'm this hero because I'm vying on behalf of the person that got done wrong. But but really, I'm projecting a shame onto mm -hmm. that person and shame never leads to better behavior mm -hmm. for anybody who's actually trying to actually help somebody be better. You you got to you got to lift people up into better behavior. You don't shame them and beat them down into better behavior. Um, so, man, I've been on both sides if we just really being real about it. And I'm not saying nobody is right, but that ignorance is, is crazy now in the Christian community. Mm -hmm. I'm new to this. Like you just said, but yeah. I'm new to this. Um, I know some brought, Bible verses I don't know up. a lot. No, because that's what they brought up. They was like, well, well, he said this to this about this certain pastor. Who's my friend? But I was like, nah, he done came over to the other side. Yeah. Because see, when I came from Pretty Willie to Christianity, like, okay, I'm going to go ahead and live, you know, live for Christ. I'm going to start going to church. Like, there were certain people who shunned me. Right. And the truth is, money was my God. Mm. Like, I got $30,000 in ca you know carry cash back in, I'm a little older you know you have to carry cash you got 30 grand he, Rod got 10 I got 12 and we all got rubber bands and so I'm solid I don't need no Jesus I don't need nothing but the money cause the girls coming with the money the liquor coming with power, the money respect. I got power when I walk in I just point at the DJ and er they pretty willy in the house and I'm like hey 2200 that's gonna get everybody cause 2200 you could dang there buy at the bar and say Louis 2200 for the hour hey the bar free courtesy of pretty willy I'm God Yeah. in my opinion I can do whatever I wanna do I'm omnipresent in St. Louis Yeah. and so I'm like but, it's, but I'm empty and I'm like, God, do something for me. And so I submit my life to Christ and I run to the Christians. And they was just like, eh, that's pretty willy. How long would this last? He's just, this is what they said. He's just doing it because he flopped. But they didn't even know that I had a deal with Warner Brothers. I'm like, this ain't flop. I ain't Nelly. If y'all compare me to him, cause Nelly making, you know, he, yeah, he yeah, 30 million so. records sold. Oh, but I'm hood rich. I can do whatever I want to do. So I didn't do it because I did it because I knew that's what was needed. Cause even at this level, there was a void. So for me, when I, when I seen you, I would, I would say, I know what he said about such and such, but I'm saying, he has no reason to come to me in all humility and say, man, I need accountability because I'm new to this. These are some different principles for me. This, I, well, I don't want to put it out there. He's like, man, you know, the woman that I wish she really into it. And I'm trying to, you yeah. know, I'm trying to, Good I want to be the version that for her that I need to be because she, you know, that she on lead, Jesus. Man, that can lead a godly woman that, that's yeah. really in that word like that. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, I came to you, man, because I know. I'm not I'm not good at this, but it, it it was interesting. I'm not gonna lie, the Christian community definitely didn't embrace me. It was um, and I'm not playing victim because it is what it is, but it was like an aha, glad I got you, you know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. when it happened, I definitely needed um I needed more support, but you know what it allowed me to do? It allowed me not to rely on people for that strength. It it forced me to really meditate on the word and not on the comment sections. Because it was only the word that said, like, I'm above and not beneath. I'm the head and not the tail. I'm more than a conqueror. You know, before I was formed in my mother's womb, God had a plan for me. And he's going to see through that good work to the end. Like, it's not going to stop just because people now have an opinion. And something I did last summer was this, that, and the other. Like, no, like, I'm going now accountable to God's viewpoint of me and not the people's viewpoint of me. Not even my fans that, you know, a lot of them was like, hey, you know, we don't like what you did, but we still support you. I couldn't even rely on that for strength and faith to keep doing what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And so um, it forced me, man, that that rejection forced me closer to God because I'm like, that's the only word that ain't changing. Honestly, man, you know, the day may come where some people decide they to forgive me or whatever. That can go either way, man. The hell you and the nail you. That's just being real with you. You know, we look at a lot of our stars. For some reason, we enthusiastically look for our, our biggest stars or biggest voices to come crashing down in our community. Something mm -hmm. about it just really excites us. I don't mm -hmm. know what it is. Yes, nice. But in God's eyes, like, no, like you're, you're worthy of dying for. You are worth dying for to come down in my son's, my, my son's form and die for you. Like that's regardless. That's before you ever sinned and after you sinned. Yeah. So um, if it forced me to really reiterate my identity in in God in in that version, not in the brand, not in the love or the hate. 
And so that was kind of the blessing that came from the judgment, if you will. And um, I think God also used that to kind of correct me in any judgment that may have been in my voice, because he's the one that gave me this gift. And, and I think he saw it and said, it needs some refinement. You know, we gotta, we gotta break some things down in that message because you're missing some people that you could be reaching. Maybe you could have picked up that pastor that you talked about. Maybe you could have picked up that person over here that went through that thing that you really was going through too, if you had already been humbled. So now we're gonna fix this. And then the fact that you keep going according to what I've called you to do, despite these people not really rocking with you anymore, is gonna be a testimony to somebody as well, mm -hmm. who other people feel like ain't worthy of doing what God has called them to do. So, yeah. Have you forgiven you? If you have, what was that process? And That's if good. you have not, what will that process look like? <clears throat> as far as forgiving myself, um, it's still a process. I'm, I'm figuring it out. I can't say I have. Um, not just, you know, for my wife, and I'm not saying uh, I'm insensitive to what she's experiencing and has experienced. But, you know, she can always find another me. She can always find another man that's better than me. Um, and I'm sure she will. She's a wonderful woman. But the children didn't ask to be in this situation. My daughters, my son, you know, especially him, he was born into a lot of this chaos. My, my eldest daughter, she had at least a, a couple of years you know, some level of sanity. My youngest daughter never know what it feels like to be in a two parent household with her biological parents. Um, and every time I see them not having clarity, certainty, maybe even internalizing things, struggling with things. I miss mommy or, you know, whenever she's calling me because our son is acting up, you know, I miss dad. I always track back to something I did and I have to kind of re-forgive myself every time. And I'm not always successful. How do you get, how do you become successful? Or have you figured that part out? I'm working toward it, man. Um, what I'm doing, and I'm not saying this is gonna work for everybody, but I'm trying to lean on God's forgiveness. I'm trying to let his forgiveness be sufficient. I can't say I've emotionally experienced that forgiveness, but I do believe it. And I think it's gonna take some time for my faith to match up to that so that I can walk in that forgiveness. But again, man, this, you know, divorce, especially splitting up a home and um, the impact that can have to the children, it's, it's, it's like a death you have to die every single time. Mm -hmm. That there's any type of question that they have that you can't answer, um, any type of impact you see on them. But I think it's paramount that for anybody going through it, especially if you're the, the reason or, or a large part of the reason why things happen the way that they did, that you make that a priority. Mm -hmm. Because again, you can't shame yourself. You can't shame your way into better behavior. And I know, you know, if I don't get that together, I can't be in a new relationship and be a healthy contributor. Because mm -hmm. I'm gonna still be trying to solve and soothe that shame. I'm gonna be operating from that place. And it's gonna be another continuation of the pattern. Yeah, no, that's good. That's good. Um, of course, there's a lot of things we'll talk about on, online, but it was somebody, just real quick, I just, I just remember one of our Patreon members, they wanted to ask, like, we talked a little bit about being faithful. But what, you know, they still thirsty. <laughs> it's just like, what does the ultimate woman look like, like for Derek? Like, is there an attribute that you look for in a woman that you like, man, that was the part that may not have been mm. willingly available in this relationship. But this time I'll be smart enough to look for a woman who has blank, fill in that blank. The blank can be filled in with what I bring out of her. Um, it's not so much the attribute of the woman, but it's like, what version of her are you cultivating on a regular basis? It's like, you know, whenever Adam was out of place, well, Eve was talking to the serpent. God didn't say, Eve, where are you? He said, Adam, where art thou? It starts with us, basically. Mm -hmm. it, it's not just about whether or not she's good or bad or she has these attributes. It's like, no, you're, you're the gardener, Adam. And, and then from there, I'm, I'm probably going to look for the relationship she has with herself. Um, because if I ever were to- She ain't taking no more projects. You like, gonna be home. No, I'm not even saying she was a project. Let okay. me be very clear. Yeah. But I'm saying in, in terms of trying to love, I actually, I think this goes both ways. Mm -hmm. I think for a woman even, and I'm not trying to give advice, but just for a woman, even you date a man and he has a bad relationship with himself, he can't receive you. Yeah, love you more. Too much pride, you know, too many project trust issues, et cetera, et cetera. You can try to maximize everything in his life, love on him, et cetera. It's gonna be like pouring into a, a cup with no bottom to it. Um, and the same thing kind of goes vice versa. 
you know, if I if I do all of this work on myself as I'm continuing to do, and you know, then I feel like I'm ready to seriously day get out here and you know give this thing another shot. And I get with a woman who has not done the work on herself. I am going to go into fix it mode, and and that's not what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, I'm going to be loving somebody who can't receive it, don't know how to receive it, and therefore it may bring the worst out of me as well. So uh, the the biggest thing is not looks it's not and, and not that that was ever missing but you know it's nothing physical it's not even just um mental emotional and super spiritual it's like you know what's the relationship that you have with yourself are you willing to actually leave me if i ever stray away from my commitment so that you don't get brought down any hole with me etc cetera, etc cetera, that you can hold me accountable and not fear losing me uh, for some fear of abandonment that you haven't healed within yourself and can you receive love from the version of me I know I'm about to bring to this relationship because I done been through the fire. I'm not mm. going through that again. I'm mm. not going back to those patterns of three years ago. You know, them last couple of years of my marriage, I proved to myself I can show up as a faithful husband, even being miserable, even being in shame, even being broken. Um, and what I'm going to bring to my wife, I need her to be ready to receive that. Yeah. That she only can do that if she has a healthy relationship with herself. That's good. Them last few years, you was faithful. Yeah, absolutely. That's dope. Yeah. Well, you, hey, I, listen, I'm with it 120. Listen, make sure you subscribe to this channel. Uh, you know, I can hang out with Derek so much because he started dropping them jewels at the end, didn't he? He says, What you said about the pouring in the cup without a bottom at the bottom? <laughs> Man, I, he done clicked into, he done, like we was, he done clicked into Derek. <laughs> no, but I love it. Family, listen, subscribe to this channel. Here's the thing become a part of our community. Y'all like this beautiful set? Cool, that's good. But I want you to partner with us because KD charged me to be in here. Okay, let's just get that out of the way. We friends, big brother, all that good stuff costs a nice little pretty penny. So one or two things gonna happen. This set gonna change and it ain't gonna look as good as you been enjoying right now or you gonna be a part of my partnership and what's gonna happen is, um, if I can be very honest with you, this is new to me. Um, this version of myself, I've never brought to the forefront. I've never took this this layer of this beautiful onion and said, here, world, deal with it. And so there are going to be some times when I'm very insecure and I would love for you to be a part of my community so you can give me some pointers. Not that your opinion matters so much that I won't do what I'm called to do, but I would love to re refine this version with you. So I want you to be a director in what we do so you can become a partner. So make sure that you click the link here um, at the bio if you're watching on Facebook. Uh, make sure you click somewhere. If you're watching on Instagram, click the link up there. You know, it's all good. Willie Mo Jr., love you more, love yourself more. And uh, thank you, Derek. Thank you for being a part of this uh, opportunity. Man, it was my pleasure. I appreciate you having me. Indeed. I would have worn my shirt off, but Derek Owens, big as my thigh. <laughs> Praise be to God. <laughs> Love you more, love you more, love you more. Hey family, make sure that you like, comment, and subscribe to this channel. Every week, it's going up. Love you more podcast, flat out.